There is a great new book out that I want to share with you. It's called This Is Your Brain on Food, an Indispensable Guide to the Surprising Foods that Fight Depression, Anxiety, PTSD, OCD, ADHD, and more. I'm Trudy Scott, food med expert, certified nutritionist, author of the Anti-Anxiety Food Solution, and host of the Anxiety Summit. With me today is Dr. Uma Naidu here to talk about fermented foods and social anxiety, vitamin D and anxiety, dietary sources of polyphenols and ADHD. A very big uh, welcome, Dr. Naidu, and congratulations on your new book. Thank you so much, Trudy. I'm very excited to be talking to you, especially about my new book. It's so exciting, and it's a perfect book for my community. I've read it. I absolutely love it, and I love sharing great resources uh, with my community. So I'm so excited to have you here so we can talk about specific sections of the book, and then we'll point people to some other areas that they can look at. Great. Excited to do that. Let me just read your bio and then we'll have you share some gems. Dr. Uma Naidu, as described by Michelin starred chef David Booley, is the world's first triple threat in the food and medicine space, a Harvard board certified psychiatrist, professional chef, and a trained nutrition specialist. Dr. Naidu founded and directed the first hospital-based nutritional psychiatry service in the United States. She's also the director of nutritional and lifestyle psychiatry at Massachusetts General Hospital and the director of nutritional psychiatry at MGH Academy while serving on the faculty at Harvard Medical School. She was named Harvard's mood food expert and has been featured in the Wall Street Journal. So, uh, Dr. Nadi, you mentioned uh, as you were getting ready for this that the, the book is called something else in other countries. Yes. Yeah, so in the, in the United States and Canada, it's called This Is Your Brain on Food. The same content, same cover, but different title in the UK, Australia, and a few other countries, including South Africa, it, it's called The Food Mood Connection. Um, so if you search it under that name uh, at your bookseller, you may find it there. Okay. Great. Well, let's talk about a 2015 study on people who were eating fermented foods and they found a change in their social anxiety. Exactly. So um, this particular study uh, basically looked at uh, fermented foods, neuroticism and uh, social anxiety. And they found that uh, by including fermented foods in the diet, it actually led to a lesser level of social anxiety and uh, neurotic traits. So I think that that's helpful for people to understand because, you know, fermented foods are so easy to, to add to our diets through food sources. And I think that if you are someone struggling with these conditions, my feeling and philosophy around this is unless you're allergic to something or have a food intolerance, why not include it and see if you feel better in terms of these symptoms. So give us some examples of fermented foods and beverages that you recommend to your patients. Sure. So I like um, the ones that I like are things like kefir, which is a soured yogurt, as you know. And I like to suggest the unflavored type that you can, you know, use even for creamy salad dressing, and you can use it in so many different ways, rather than the fruited kind, which adds back too much added sugar to to the kefir. So unsweetened kefir, I love miso, and in fact, one of my favorite recipes is in the book because sweet potatoes are a great source of a complex carbohydrate, and I pair miso with the sweet potatoes um, and it ends up being great roasted flavor but miso brings back the ferment fermentation um, and adds back a fermented food. I also like kombucha but I always caution people about the source of the kombucha because the added sugars can work against you. And I think, Trudy, you educated me about something um, when we were chatting earlier um, around, I think it was the, was it the fluoride in the kombucha? But that's something I would ask you to maybe mention as well. And then my other favorite fermented food is kimchi. Yes, uh, we uh, mentioned that the tea is a source of natural fluoride, a natural source of fluoride, and in the water, if it's been if fluoride's been added, it could be a problem. So just be aware of that. But I love the idea of the roasted sweet potato. That sounds lovely with the miso, and then a creamy salad dressing. How? Give me some ideas on how you would do that. 
Exactly. So because, you know, um, kefir is kind of, certainly the type that I get is slightly thin. It's like a thin soured yogurt is how I think about it. And so what I do is that any, any recipe that say calls for a healthy substitution of using yogurt to make the, say, so, so for example, a ranch dressing, rather than use a mayo, mayonnaise base, uh, what you can actually do is, is substitute that with a, a rich, you know, pr a protein based yogurt. But I also use kefir. It's slightly thinner. And, you know, it just, you add the same ingredients that you would in um, the same spices you would to ranch dressing and flavor it up that way. And what I like that it does, it, it, it adds a creaminess that, you know, uh, it has a slightly sour taste. Um, and if you get used to that and add back your spices, it's usually pretty delicious. Oh, sounds lovely. And uh, there's, you write about uh, vitamin D in your book and how that can actually help reduce anxiety. So tell us about this. Sure. So, so um, studies have actually demonstrated that adults with both depression and anxiety have often been found to have lower levels of blood levels of vitamin D. And a 2019 study um, showed and tested approximately 51 women with diabetes and vitamin D deficiency. And what they were looking to see was whether the um, vitamin D pill every few weeks would help their or change the anxiety levels. Um, and what they found was that um, after 16 weeks, uh, they compared people who took the placebo to those who took the vitamin D and those individuals who took the vitamin D were significantly less anxious. Um, and then another study uh, was that um, vitamin D was administered as part of a micronutrient intervention to more than 8,000 people who were depressed and anxious. Um, and keeping, you know, keeping vitamin D levels high was, was found to be protective against anxiety. So there's several studies that are showing this. And, you know, I think that it, it's helpful for individuals to know that um, vitamin D is something that they can look at if they're feeling anxious uh, as well. And uh, with, obviously with vitamin D, you'd want to test first to see what your levels are before supplementing. Exactly. Absolutely. You want to check your level and you don't want to, you know, take a ton of vitamin D without knowing your level. So that's an excellent point. Right. Your doctor can easily do that with a blood test. Yeah. And that's something you may need to ask your doctor to do. It's not always done, but it's something that more and more uh, doctors are doing. And it's, it's so interesting to see that we've got so many applications for vitamin D and here we've got another one, which is anxiety and 8,000 people in a study. That's, that's a, a large study, which is very encouraging to see. It, Exactly. That was, that was a pretty robust, uh, well, that was a pretty robust study. Absolutely. And then uh, there's good food sources of vitamin D as well. Can you share what some of those would be? Exactly. So many products in the United States are actually fortified with vitamin D, but I, I still suggest the whole food products, um, as, as you and I have touched base on before, Trudy, just whole foods are always the way to go. Um, but, you know, things like egg yolk, salmon, um, sun-dried mushrooms, cod liver oil, um, all contain vitamin D. Um, if you, you know, if you say a vegan and you, and you don't use milk sources, um, you know, you, um, you, you may be slightly more predisposed to um, vitamin D deficiency. You obviously want to check with your doctor, check the blood level, but you can also try to uh, find other forms uh, to your diet like sun-dried mushrooms and also sun exposure. And by the way, with sun exposure, it has to be direct uh, sun exposure with appropriate, you know, sunblock or um, uh, sunscreen screen, but it shouldn't be through a window. Uh, it's not found to be effective uh, to obtain vitamin D through, uh, through a window. Thanks for clarifying that. And I'm, I'm so glad you mentioned egg yolks because <laughs> that has had such a bad rep reputation and they are so nutrient dense. Vitamin yeah. D, good source of choline, uh, yeah, we should exactly. not be avoiding egg yolks. <laughs> we shouldn't be avoiding it. It, it. it kind of, you know, it goes back to my Goldilocks rule, which is, you know, just uh, everything in moderation, not too much, not too little, just enough so that you get the good value of the nutrient without increasing your calories um, too much or increasing the, the ingredients that could be potentially negative or harmful. Right. Beautiful. And then, of course, salmon, I uh, uh, absolutely love salmon. What about yes. sardines? Are they a good source of vitamin D as well? No, not, not that I know off the top of my head. I can certainly look at that. I know that sardines are a great source of, um, of omega-3s. You know, they're one of the fatty fish. Um, I'm not quite sure, though, about vitamin D. Okay. 
Uh, and then you also write about uh, dietary poly polyphenols in your book uh, and talking about how that they can actually help with ADHD symptoms. Exactly. So um, there's a 2018 study that looked at um, that, you know, natural antioxidants like dietary polyphenols and whether this could be helpful in, in helping symptoms of ADHD. And uh, the study found that, that they were, and the mechanism was thought to be that they helped to alleviate oxidative stress on the brain. And I felt that that was encouraging um, that, you know, because studies have also shown that individuals with ADHD are at greater risk of oxidative stress in the in brain tissue. Um, so it's possible that therefore using uh, a, a rich source of polyphenols um, uh, would, would be able to help this. And then give us some examples of these foods that contain these polyphenols. Um, sure. So, you know, polyphenols can, um, I, 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 off the top of my head, I can't remember exactly which ones they used in the study, um, but polyphenols that basically um, can be found in things like extra virgin olive oil, um, can be found in, um, you know, rich sources of uh, fruits and vegetables, the color that, you know, um, is in fruits and vegetables, uh, the antioxidant benefit are also what, uh, what, what where we, we find the polyphenols. Okay. I found this section so interesting because you also write about how this acts like a low-dose toxin that trains the body to mount an immune response. So that was fascinating. I, 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 I absolutely. So, so I, I, I'm glad you, you, you picked up on that. Yeah, I read, I read it cover to cover. It's a fantastic <laughs> book. It really is. Lots of little gems there and I love that your focus is real whole foods. It's the foundation of what we do. And we, we've talked about that offline and how important it is to eat these real whole foods. And But what I think is really interesting about your book and the studies that you quote is that you are sharing a lot of the mechanisms and we can be excited about food, but certainly myself and I know a lot of people in my community, they want to understand why. Why is, you know, why are berries good for us? Why is egg yolk good for us? And if we can understand some of those mechanisms, I think it makes food even more exciting. <laughs> it does. It does. I, and you have to, you know, it, it's no longer that people, part of the mission of writing this and, and sharing this treaty was, really that many of my patients are coming in saying, you know, why should I eat avocados? I know it's healthy, but what does it do? You know, why do, why does everyone magazine tell me that blueberries are, have an antioxidant? What does that mean to me? So sometimes just unpacking even what an antioxidant is for people is super helpful because I find that then they want to make a positive healthy habit change towards, you know, healthy whole foods. Right. Absolutely. Now, something else you write about is a 36-year-old patient who had severe anxiety. Um, he was also binge eating and he had a history of alcohol abuse. And you write about how B vitamins can help. And then there was one specific B vitamin that is very helpful when someone has um, alcohol abuse issues. Absolutely. So uh, vitamin B1 or thiamine is something that actually, you know, the medical side of things, um, when someone is going through alcohol detoxification, it's something that we replenish as part of the treatment protocol. But what this study showed um, was that, you know, uh, it, it, uh, uh, and, and what it what showed clinically with this particular individual was um, taking 250 milligrams uh, a day um, of vitamin B1, which is thiamine, was actually found to be super helpful. Um, so it was great to see that, you know, work in practice as well. Very, very good. And then I wanted to talk about sleep because that's a common issue with people with anxiety is having sleep problems. And you write about chamomile and how yes. that can help. Can you just share uh, one of the studies that you mentioned in the book and then any precautions with using chamomile tea? Sure. So, you know, chamomile um, has definitely, people have associated with, say, low levels of anxiety. Um, chamomile is actually an herb and it comes from a daisy-like type of flower um, and, you know, frequently is used as a natural remedy for certain health conditions, um, but also is frequently used as a tea. We know that it has helped uh, lower levels of anxiety. We also know that it has a very calming, soothing effect that helps with sleep. But there are some precautions as with um, many of, you know, there's certain foods in the book. We probably looked at 
225 foods, approximately, and nutrients in the book. And certainly for some of them, we have some cautions. Um, we talked about in a different conversation, tree glutamates. And, and, and what I would say here is one to three cups a day of chamomile is generally okay. But if you're taking a blood thinner medication and you're about, or you're about to have surgery, you might want to cut back and make sure that your doctor knows. There's also some precautions regarding pregnant women who should definitely consult their doctors uh, before consuming chamomile tea because some studies have uh, suggested that they can stimulate contractions, uh, especially in the first trimester. So it's just a caution there to a natural, otherwise healthy substance, you know, can be uh, concerning in certain conditions. Really good to have those cautions there and I appreciate you for, for sharing them. I did not know about the pregnancy uh, caution, so that's really good to know. And I think individuals may, you know, may differ in terms of how they respond. That's why you just want to have, you just want to check with your OB before you, before you, you know, you drink it during pregnancy. Absolutely. Now you've got a recipe section in the book. Tell us about your golden milk recipe. So golden milk, you know, it's interesting because my grandmother would uh, would make uh, make us uh, golden golden milk or golden golden chai. And basically, the golden uh, word really comes from the addition of turmeric spice, and turmeric is one of my favorite spices. You'll notice it as I know you've read the book because it has so many health benefits, and it's almost as though the things my grandmother would tell me growing up actually have truly showing up at the science uh, over these many decades and. Um, you know, turmeric has this uh, active ingredient called curcumin, which is activated by a pinch of black pepper. Um, and the piperine in black pepper makes the, the curcumin more bioavailable, better absorbed for our body and our brain. So I always add that, uh, add that in now that I know that medical fact. And I also think what's cool about the golden milk recipe is you can substitute the milk of your choice. And, um, and I think it's a great way to incorporate a healthy spice like turmeric um, if it's not something you cook with. Uh, you know, many people call it curry spice. It's actually in, in spice all on its own. It may give curry spice that people are familiar with the yellow color, but you know, adding it to a super smoothie or golden milk is an easy way to, um, to have it if you're not used to it uh, or used to cooking with it. And then, so what's in, what goes into the golden milk? Um, so if I remember what, what I added to it, I don't have the recipe in front of me. It's basically, um, I use, I think I prefer almond milk in mine. Um, you know, I use a quarter teaspoon at least of turmeric. Um, and this I'm referring to the powdered uh, turmeric that you can get in most supermarket aisles these days. You can even get organic versions. I use a pinch of black pepper and um, I add a little bit of water. Um, and, and, you know, you can also go in the direction of making a golden chai, which is then you brew your tea and you add the golden milk, which is the almond milk, the, the pinch of black pepper, the quarter teaspoon of turmeric, make it nice and creamy. You can even froth it and you can add that to your um, black tea as well. Lovely. I'm so glad you mentioned uh, your grandmother because there was a uh, reading about uh, your memories of uh, you called her Pine Town Granny. Yes. I think yes. it was lovely and it just brings back memories of me growing up with my granny and her helping me cook and me watching her cook and it's so lovely to see uh, generations, generational information being passed down and now you're getting Absolutely. to share it with us in your book. It's lovely. Thank you. And, and you probably also know where Pantan is. So it was just how in my family, we identified our grandmothers in terms of which areas they lived in. So Yes, we should have clarified that. Pantan yes. is a suburb outside suburb. Durban. So that's how I knew about it. Yes, it was <laughs> lovely to see. <laughs> our grannies are wonderful, aren't they? And they've got so much wisdom that they've passed on to us. They might not exactly. have known all the signs, but they knew that when things were good. They knew us. it was good. Exactly. <laughs> it really was. So uh, tell us about one of your favorite comfort foods, dal. Exactly. So I love dal and dal um, is, you know, made from lentils. Um, and and in, in Indian cuisine, there are many, many different types of lentils that we use, as, as do many other cultures. But a dal tends to be something that you can either have in a more um, uh, whole form, so you can boil it down and, and see the lentils, or you can pressure cook it and really make it more of a creamy, smooth, almost soup-like texture. 
And um, it's one of my favorite comfort foods because you can do so much with it. You can um, add spices to it. You can add vegetables to it if you like. You can add meat to it if you wish uh, and use different recipes. But I, um, I particularly like it because it's a great source of fiber. It's a great source of uh, plant-based protein. The fiber is excellent for your gut. So, um, you know, having, having lentils in different forms, cooking them up in different ways, adding different spices and flavors, um, as, as, and especially these go, pair well with Indian spices, so mustard seeds, you know, red chili, um, you know, curry leaves and, and other spices, ginger and garlic and things like that make it very flavorful. But, you know, you're bringing back healthy whole food nutrients because you're boiling down a lentil and you're getting the fiber from it, you're getting the protein, and then you're adding vegetables or, or some, you know, lean source of protein to it that you can enjoy. And so I think it's, it's really, to me, one of the perfect foods because it's so well-rounded in, in the things that it has. It really is. And you get to add uh, some of these spices that you write about, which is uh, you're getting, you know, an added way uh, to get these spices into your diet as well. Exactly. The, the technique is called tadka. So this is technique in Indian cooking where, you know, you kind of bloom the spices and have... Can you say that again? Up. You froze yes. it. Wait, just hold it a sec. It says unstable. Is okay, say, say that again. Yeah. So one of the techniques in Indian, Indian cuisine is called tadka. It's my spelling of it is T-A-D-K-A. And, and what it is, is basically you, you, you simmer your spices so things like black mustard seeds, in order to really emit their flavor, they need to pop in the oil. And so you simmer your spices, you add in fresh ingredients like garlic and red chili and things like that. And then you add that simmering sort of um, preparation to the lentil and it brings, brings in the flavor. So it's, uh, it's just... It's just one of the ways to do it. Um, so I do that or I actually saute onions and tomato and, and other spices. And, you know, in, in some of the culinary school side of things, um, when, you, when, you, when you simmer spices in, um, in oil, they, it's called blooming because really what it's doing is releasing flavor. So it's just a great way to bring flavor to something that could otherwise be bland. Your lentils are healthy food, but they're pretty bland on their own. So. Yes, and it's so enjoyable when you add all those spices. And that's a great tip to be able to bring that flavor out. It really is. Exactly. Dr. Nadu, this has been fabulous. Uh, thank you so much for the work that you do in nutritional psychiatry. It's really exciting to be um, in this field right now with, uh, you know, having someone like you uh, leading the way in nutritional psychiatry, seeing all this research that supports what we see clinically when it comes to food and mental health. So thank you very much for the work that you do. Thank you, Trudy. It's always such a pleasure to talk with you and connect with you. And thank you for the work that you do and that you bring forward and uh, for sharing, you know, for, for sharing uh, all of this with me and inviting me. I appreciate it. Well, please, can you go ahead and share the name of your book again and then your website and where people can find you on social media? Great. Thank you so much. So in the United States and Canada, the book is called This Is Your Brain on Food. And in some countries, it's same content, exact same book cover, but different name called The Food Mood Connection um, is available in the UK, Australia, South Africa as well under that title. Um, you can find the book at your major online retailer. Um, and it's also available at my website because we link out to all the different book sites. Um, and my site is umanaidumd.com, which is U M A. N-A-I-D-O-O-M-D.com. And please follow us on social where we, we share tons of fun information and updated research all the time. Um, and to be kind of nutrition nerds and love to share that all the time as well as recipes. And you can find us at D-R-U-M-A-N-A-I-D-O-O, -O, which is at Dr. Uma Naidu, but it's all one word. Lovely. And I love that. Nutrition nerds. Yay. <laughs> We are. We always, we we always really share are. these fun facts about bacteria and, I the know. and everything else and geeking out on exactly. all of this. It's exciting. And it's inspired people to want to, to learn more and to eat real food and to you know, see the benefits um, and, and understand why it's, why it's helping them. I love it. Thank you so much exactly. again, Dr. Naidu, for spending time with us. And uh, we'll be sharing this uh, via the blog and uh, via uh, the video as well, so everyone can b both watch and read. Thanks again for joining us. Thank you so much, Trudy. It's always a pleasure. Take good care. Take care. Bye now. This is Trudy Bye. signing off.